I love bourbon, but I'm not ready to restart my career and be a distiller. I have a bachelor's degree, and I want to continue to use those skills in the whiskey industry. So check this out. The University of Louisville now has an online distilled spirits business certificate that focuses on the business side of the spirits industry, like finance, marketing, and operations. This is perfect for anyone looking for more professional development. And if you ever want to get your MBA, the certificate credits transfer into UofL's new online MBA program. Learn more about this online program at uofl.me slash pursue spirits. When we're live at Kenny's dining room table, we get UPS men and yeah. you know, and barking dogs. <laughs> That's true. Not newsfeed. I, it's not the same without a, a UPS delivery and the dog barking. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're like, all right, cut it, <laughs> stop it. What we say? Okay, back at it. All right, everyone, it is episode 221 of Bourbon Pursuit. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny, and as usual, we got a little bit of news to run through. The 2019 Bourbon Hall of Fame induction ceremony was two weeks ago, and I completely forgot to give them a shout out here on the podcast. But congratulations to Peggy No Stevens, Larry Cass, Wes Henderson, and Evan Colesveen on all their accomplishments. If you're interested to hear their stories and their appearances on the podcast, you can go back and listen to episodes 6, 153, 157, 167, 173, 181, 198, and 204. I guess we've been covering a lot of these people throughout the years. I'm glad to see that we're being able to bring those stories to light. A news story was on a local Louisville news station here last week. And it talked about a new bourbon warehouse being erected in Jefferson Town, which is a part of the Louisville area. But this one's quite different. You may remember us talking to Busick Construction back on episode 137 and how their proprietary ricking system is used in a lot of places that we see on the bourbon trail. But we're now also seeing a lot of palletized warehouses becoming increasingly more common because of lowering cost. Well, this new warehouse that is being planned is made of shipping containers. The developer wants to stack shipping containers six stories high, and these plans were filed with the Louisville Metro government, but at this time, no bourbon distiller has been mentioned for the project. So who knows what this could end up being like because of airflow and other factors that uh, that are in place, but the video news stories can be found with the link in our show notes. We talk a lot about the culture that builds around bourbon, and the online community is a huge portion of that. Reddit, which is the biggest message board that's out there today, has now surpassed 100,000 members in the R Bourbon Forum. We recently interviewed one of the Reddit mods for an upcoming podcast, which will air here in the next few months. We're continually moving forward with single barrel offerings that we want to have for our Patreon community. And the newest one that we are ready to announce is that we've been allocated a barrel of Eagle Rare. We'll be working through the process of nailing down a date and we will select eight Patreon community members to join us as we go to choose a barrel. Thank you to our partner Keg and Bottle in the Southern California area for making this all happen. You can find hundreds of different whiskeys and bourbons on their website and have them delivered to your door all around the country at kegandbottle.com. That's keg, the letter in, bottle.com. And you can also learn more about what we offer at patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. Are you going to be visiting Louisville soon and maybe looking for the best restaurants or whiskey bars to visit? Well, Ryan and I, we live here and we built up a Yelp collection to help you navigate our favorite places in the city. And you can get that link in our show notes as well. Now, today's podcast is all about barrel bourbon. We had Tripp and Joe back on episode 164, but it's time that we get an update from what's happening with this team. They've been winning all kinds of awards, but we want to talk more about what they're doing inside these walls. We talk about the flavors that they're pulling from different states of distillation and how that goes into the blend, as well as about hearing their newest release of the Vatted American Single Malt. We then talk about some of the gripes we all have with the TTB. We take another stab at talking about online sales. And then we look at the future with new offerings. And of course, looking at their new future dovetail offering. Now, before you hear from Joe in the podcast, you get to also hear from him before Above the Char with Fred Minnick. So with that, let's get on with the show. Hi, this is Joe from Barrel Bourbon. 
Our bourbons have won a few medals at some of the most prestigious spirits competitions out there. But don't take their word for it. Find out for yourself. Lift your spirits with Barrel Bourbon. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. I often solicit ideas from listeners for Above the Char. This idea comes from Don Knotts, and Don is a longtime listener, and I really appreciate this uh, idea because it's one I've actually done a lot of research on, and I'm quite fascinated with it. And that's kind of the short history of barrel-proof bourbons. Have they always been this popular? And the answer is no. Now, in the 1800s, they would actually advertise themselves as barrel strength or barrel proof, or some would even say that they were fireproof, meaning that they would catch on fire. And so that the proof in the 1800s was a way of advertising the fact that they were pure. They were real whiskey versus being adulterated with like prune juice or water or tobacco spit or whatever the rectifiers or wholesalers were doing. And so barrel proof in the 1800s meant something entirely different. Now, we kind of lose track of this barrel proof subject during prohibition and 100 proof kind of becomes the standard and we don't really reset in terms of what is being bottled until the 1930s, specifically 1935 to 1942, really. And you would find some brands who are trying to market themselves as barrel proof or what they would refer to as barrel whiskey. Weller was one that probably did it the best. Now, they were going in the barrel uh, at a very low entry proof and um, it was coming out 108 to 112 proof. In fact, the barrel entry proof up until like 1962 was 110. So the barrel strength bourbon coming out prior to 1962 would have been between 108 and 112. But we don't really see the explosion or interest of barrel proof bourbon until really the last 10 to 15 years. But there's one brand we can point toward as being the most important for leading this trend, and that is Booker's. Booker's comes out in 1987 and was really the first to push the barrel-proof conversation in American households. And you had Booker No going around the country saying, you don't want to drink too much of this because it'll knock you back. Well, the truth is, is that we don't really market it for like its strength for alcohol purposes. Today, we market it for the flavor intensity. And that's kind of where we are right now with American whiskey is we're looking at things in terms of how they taste. And people think that they find more flavor in the barrel-proof products. But here's the thing. Don't be fooled by the flavor necessarily. That high alcohol can actually mask a lot of flaws. That's why distilleries will cut the alcohol down to 40 proof to see if they find any flaws in the distillate or the barrel whiskey. So, if you think you really like a barrel-proof product, add a bunch of water, taste it again, and see if it still has some of those characteristics that you like. Just because it's high in alcohol doesn't mean it's good. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you have an idea like Don did for Above the Char, hit me up on Twitter or Instagram, at Fred Minnick. That's at Fred Minnick. Until next week, cheers! Welcome, everybody, to another episode of A Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. And we are down here at Down One Bourbon Bar in Louisville, Kentucky. Once again, we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, barrel bourbon. And they do more than just Kentucky, right? They, yep. they, they bring stocks from a lot of different places. And their whole goal is to blend something that's truly unique and different. And it's never going to be replicated again. So each batch is is like that. Yep. So it's it, funny. Uh, Joe and I were talking before about people in Kentucky are laser focused on Kentucky only. And we were kind of guilty of that as well. And we had our blinders on and, uh, and then with barrel, they, you know, they're introducing a lot of stuff to the market and you're like, okay, this is actually good. And where is this coming from? Where else? What, you know, so it's like, I don't know. They brought a lot of stuff that I never thought I would enjoy, but I really enjoy the, the offerings they have. Yeah, they really do. I mean, even at the, even the single barrel program that they offer, um, it's it's something that most people, if it was just anything else, they might snub their nose at it. But Barrel is bringing out some 
killer barrels that are coming uh, through their single barrel program. And, you know, most of them are all distilled in Tennessee. And that's one of the things that I think it's starting to change those people's minds of really what else is out there. And they're kind of on the forefront of it. Yeah, it even inspired us to start our own brand. So thank you guys uh, for, <laughs> Anytime. for the catalyst. And <laughs> yeah, not only that, thank you for these killer dog toys. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you haven't seen these, they're barrel bourbon uh, dog toys. They're, yeah. they're awesome. They are expanding. So that's why we it. always love having them. They bring booze and now dog toys. So <laughs> I can't wait till next time. So let's go ahead and introduce our guest today. So today we have the founder of Barrel Bourbon as well as the master distiller of Barrel, Bur- Barrel Bourbon. So we've got Joe Beatrice and Trip Stimson. So guys, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having having us. us. Yeah, so last time you were on was episode 164, so it's been a while now. And uh, I would imagine that, are your necks hurting? Because you're carrying around all these gold medals that you're getting at all these competitions? A little bit, yeah. 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 But it looks really good when we go out. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) A little flavor flavor. We we wear a lot of them, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean... He's like the Michael Phelps of bourbon. Kind of. Yeah, kind of like that. I mean, how many... What did you come away with from from San Francisco this past year? Because it was a lot. Oh, this year we won, uh, I think it's three gold medals and three double golds. We also we also picked up the best uh, small batch bourbon over 10 years old award. Mm-hmm. That's so, impressive. Yeah. Who gets to keep the medal? <laughs> we have them in a case and a display case. Yeah. We, we take turns wearing them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is your week. And this is mine. Yeah. <laughs> so before we start talking about more of the whiskey and some of that kind of things, I, give people, again, just a reminder, a little bit about your background and sort of where this all built out of because maybe they're not uh, good stewards yet and have it listened to episode 164 but or every episode or every episode Barrel introduces uh, Fred <laughs> on Above the Chart <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I should I should have said that I said we're here with our good friend Joe because I say that every single week I said listen to our good friend Joe from Barrel Bourbon so. <laughs> yeah and he's our good friend because he pays us no I'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was going for yeah, yeah. well we started this um, we started the company um, it's now it's sticking around our sixth year and we've just been growing in leaps and bounds. Um, this since we've seen you, um, we have. I had to make a list and I had to write it down because <laughs> it's too much. Because it was too much. I was. We we're. We've been really busy. Um, we've done. When we were here last time, we were, did our first release of the Infinite Barrel project, and since then, we've done ten bottlings of it. And just just to remind you, the way that worked is we started up by blending a large amount of whiskey. Um, and then every time we bottle, we replace that whiskey. So right now there's, there are, there's whiskeys from five countries and um, a, almost 40 different, I think it's 40 at this point, different distilleries of product that's in there. Um, we, we're going to talk a little bit about, I guess, later about Dovetail, which is, uh, which is our, one of our new releases. We just finished our third bottling of that. Um, we're in the middle of that. And we, let's see, we did three Barrel Craft Spirits products, which was a whiskey, a bourbon, and a rum. Um, we did one, two, three, four, five batch releases, a new year. Oh, gosh. About 250 single barrels and a release of Canadian single barrel rise. So... So you haven't been really that busy yeah, at all. No, no, been busy at all. Just relaxing on the beach, and <laughs> playing golf all day. It just blends and dumps and blends you, itself. You Fred <laughs> riding around golf carts in Norton Commons. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I don't have a golf cart <laughs> yet. Oh, I thought it was mandatory. <laughs> that neighborhood. It comes with the house. I guess. Yeah, it comes with that, yeah. <laughs> so, Trip, what about you? So, it, what's what's your talk about a little bit more about your role and everything that you're doing behind the scenes here? Um, so, I'm basically over everything that's operations. Um, bringing barrels in, dumping barrels, putting blends to get, uh, together. Um, I'll pull samples from all the different groupings and uh, go in the lab, put blends together, and Joe and I will sit around and taste all the different blends, uh, make decisions on what barrels go with each other to create those blends. Um, you, know, you name it. I'm, I'm involved in just about everything. Mm-hmm. So the blends start with you or Joe? Like what's the blend, going in? The on. blends just kind of, it's a conversation. Um, we know we're going to do something. We talk about what we have. Um, we fill in the gaps with things that we need. We, I mean, we ask each other the question, what do you think it needs? And then we go back to our stockpile of barrels and say, well, in the past, we've had good luck with these particular flavors that we're looking for in this particular uh, warehouse from this particular distillery. 
So then we'll bring those in and we'll try it small scale first. If we like it, then we'll scale it up. And we'll scale it up stepwise uh, to make sure we don't go too far. Uh, and it gives us room to kind of go back and forth a little bit there toward the end to make sure we, uh, we really hit it on the head. It sounds like, uh, not to bring up another distillery, but we, uh, when we, you do the maker's mark, you know, different staves to do your own single barrel. It sounds like us, we go in and we're like, all right, we're going to do all these different ones and we're going to make our own barrel or whatever. And then you go back and realize that, uh, we should just start with something that somebody else <laughs> did and work our way from there, you know, cause they have good flavors. So it sounds like a lot like that process for you all. It is. And it's a very tedious process. It's, um, a lot of time spent tasting different things, walking away, coming back. Um, again, like we talked about last time, Joe and I have similar palates, but we're hypersensitive to different things that we may or may not like. So it works very well when we have the conversation about putting our blends together because I may not get something that Joe gets or I may taste something that Joe doesn't. And we kind of we take each other's word on that and, and, and just keep on pushing forward. Are you taste? I mean, I'm just say, are you tasting every barrel that's walking through this door as well? Because I know that you you're blending on a pretty large scale. So it's, are you like, okay, well, these barrels represent this lot, and it should have some sort of similar profile. Are you are you really going through and sampling them all out? We have we have to look at them as lots to some degree because to taste every single barrel, I mean, we'd never leave, right? So. We we spent enough time doing this. Well, some people would think that's really a bad thing. You know, you get to just stay there all day and just drink whiskey. <laughs> we, uh, but then again, I guess it's one thing when you work in it versus actually it's doing it. Yeah. It's, it's right. not always hard and fast, though. I mean, sometimes sometimes there is a lot of variation in a particular group of barrels, and sometimes there's not as much. Every barrel is unique, but it really depends on on what we on what we're doing. You know, it's, it's yeah. sometimes we have to taste more than others. Mm-hmm. But I would say the single barrels we do yeah. uh, we do handpick those. Yeah. Um, but the batches, we, we try to rely on uh, past experiences from the different distilleries, locations, and uh, put the blends together that way. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, what's a little bit different is, you know, we actually start with a, we start with a whiteboard. It's a clean slate. We, once, it's, once something is done and, and packed up we, and, and bottled, we, we start with what are we going to do next? And then, you know, the, the first thing is we, we, we come up with maybe a concept. You know, what is it that we want? What are we going for? What are we looking for? What do we like about the last one that we maybe can tease out more and replicate? And that's really the starting point. And, and you know, and then, sort, then the hunt is on between trying to find things that actually deliver that. But we spend we can spend two weeks a month on one particular blend. It's mm-hmm. we have we have multiple projects going simultaneously at any given time. So what are some things like you said that some things that Trip likes that Joe doesn't, and vice versa? What are some of those different uh, flavors that you might like that Joe doesn't like? For example, Kenny and I, when we go pick our Pursuit series, I know Kenny's searching for tannins, oak, and I'm like, let's stay away from those. I want more of the sweet kind of flavors so what are those between you two and who trumps who <laughs> no there's never never it's always we always agree 100 percent on what we're doing or it doesn't get in the bottle but i think a lot of the differences that we talk about is it's not more of what we like and don't like i think it's what we're sensitive to so certain stringencies uh chemical notes um you know if there are any certain off notes like um uh, especially in some of the new make stuff, I'm really hypersensitive to uh, like a, a mildew note. Um, so it's it's things like that. It's not that we like things that the other doesn't. It's the hypersensitivity to the different aromas and flavors that might be in there. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Well, what are those some of those aromas that you guys are really going for when you're when you're creating the blend? I mean, you you said you start with a clean slate, but I mean, there's got to be something you're like, okay, like dark cherries or chocolate or I don't know carrot cake like i don't know like what's like carrot what's like, like what's what is it the, the carrot cake. marzipan that <laughs> yeah. fred made yes. yeah fred freaking famous fred, fred put marzipan and you all in like the same sentence all the time <laughs> I know. you're welcome that's true well i i think one of the things we really like are tropical fruit notes juicy fruit dragon fruit flavors we we love i love those we love those Absolutely. we love those anytime we can anytime we can blend to that um will we'll just stop sometimes and that's one of the reasons that batch 18 is is where it is in the sequence um is that we blended that actually last winter we blended it a long time ago and it was a relatively small batch but the, i love the story because as we were blending it we were we were as trip said we step our way up to the volume like we come up with the theoretical in the lab and then we try to replicate it with the barrels and as we do that 
we we taste we stop and we taste and this one we both at the same time said we can't add not add one more barrel and it was maybe two-thirds of what we wanted and we just stopped because it was exactly we had those super sweet notes at the in the mid palate of it we just we love that um we i think we look for a balance of the tannins and, and grain and i mean that's that's all really important balance is really key to us we don't we, we try to make it as balanced as we possibly can balance but without basically recreating the same thing over and over so i mean there's there's there's, there's got to be a lot of barrel junkies that are out there and have you been able to say like okay well i think uh you know when we did barrel batch or bourbon barrel batch uh 12 like that might be pretty close to 16 or you think like they're they're all just worlds apart i think you're going to find some similarities in in all of them because you know there's a there's a there's a grouping that we like you know we, we talk about complexity we talk about fruit and floral we talk about you know oak and vanilla and all these different flavors that are out there and all of those are going to mingle in different concentrations in all of our batches to some degree um so while some may be night and day difference uh i think you're going to be able to find some of those flavors in most of the batches um I would say something like maybe 12 or 14 is going to be a more traditional representation, which is going to be, um, you know, an, an oak forward uh, traditional style bourbon. There's not a ton of fruit. Uh, there's not a ton of floral. Whereas something like, you know, back uh, way back 7B was just loaded with, with that fruit and floral note. Um, so I, I think it, yes, the, there are differences, but there are lots of similarities as well. So when you're like making a blend and you're trying to get those different flavor notes that you're looking for, how many barrels of a certain type of whiskey to make to get to that flavor? Like, is it ten? That's such or a good five question. Or one That's or a really good two? question. It could be one. <laughs> yeah. It, it it's it has to with the threshold perception threshold of those particular compounds that you're tasting and sometimes one barrel will make all the difference and that's really? it yeah yeah that's it's crazy. pretty incredible yeah i kind of like this live thing i can get i'm getting <laughs> i get instructions sent to me as ongoing See, it's much better than kenny's really, dining room really table when we're live at kenny's dining room table we get ups men and yeah. you know and barking dogs <laughs> that's true not news feed <laughs> I, it's not the same without a, a ups delivery and the dog barking. <laughs> yeah, no. we're like all right cut it <laughs> stop it what'd we say okay <laughs> back at it. <laughs> All right. So I guess back on topic now. So, you know, we we had the opportunity of uh, getting a, a, a batch 17, and it was awesome. It was really, I mean, it was out of this world. It was one of my favorite whiskeys uh, of the probably the past uh, few months. And now, is 18 getting ready to come out? Is this released? Uh, what's what's the timeline? Yeah, we're on sold this? out. We're sold out. We're, it's oh. gone. 19's gone. We're we're 19 is almost gone, and we're teeing up 20 for next month yeah it's so you're running through these pretty quick we do about four releases a year yeah four batch releases a year and then a and then uh, the new year so it's really five five bourbons give or take yeah well, that's well and by sold out too it's it's available it's just it's all been allocated yeah right we have to think it's, it's, you can still yeah. find it yeah. just, right. we don't have any more sold out means we don't have yeah. any more we the distribute we've sold everything to the distributor and yeah. then the distributor now is pushing that means you've gotten your check and you've been paid <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> not, not the, always well yeah you, you want to make sure that it's it's not sitting on shelves either right yeah. you got to make sure you're still out there doing your marketing yeah. and yeah, we have two customers we have a customer we sell to the distributor and then we have the the end customer who's standing there so our sales are concerned with our distributor a customer and I'm concerned with you standing in the shelf or in the bar buying the product that's that's the way we look at the world mm -hmm. for sure yeah so talk about like the blends themselves because I know that a lot of these you're doing a lot of uh, I don't know is tri-state the way to really put it you know you're doing some Kentucky Tennessee Indiana um, what's what's sort of like your ratio when you're when you're looking at these? Because you know, is it is it you know 35 percent Kentucky? I'm sure it's different here and there. But like, where where do you start at? Because there's got to be a at by a now base or something. you you gotta have some sort of 
formula that you think in your head, like, okay, we know this is where we should start. How about you just we, tell we us actually, exactly yeah. what's in every blend? <laughs> yeah. What's your mash bill? Let's start with what's your blending blend? mash bill? Well, we stopped doing the mash bill because we couldn't do the math on it anymore. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's different bourbons, different mash bills, and from different states, different mash bills, and then what percentage of those barrels, and it was getting me, you know, 27.2%. It was, it was just, the math was too hard. There, we really, truly don't have a starting point. We, it really, the barrels lead us. We let the barrels lead us into into what we what makes sense and sometimes it will be more indiana forward but a lot of times it's kentucky it's um tennessee forward mm-hmm. um and and then a lot of times we it's surprisingly sometimes it's only you know 10 percent or 20 percent of a particular of a particular group that makes that influence so they're really we have no real standard or no blueprint that we start with we really do let the barrels lead us to the answer so, so in your opinion when you're tasting each one of these different regions, uh, different kinds of bourbons, what are the notes that you're pulling out? Like if you're tasting something from Indiana versus Tennessee versus Kentucky, um, do you do you think like where the, the distillery you're pulling from each has their own uniqueness to it? Or is it based by state? Like what, what do you what do you kind of see that as? I think we have well let's back up and look at it from kind of the production standpoint where you have one, we're all in the same sort of uh, region where we actually get four seasons, which is very beneficial for us. Um, and then look at the different distilleries that are going to use different yeast strains with different grain bills to create these different flavors. Uh, and then you stretch those out in warehouses to, say, northern Kentucky down into southern Tennessee, and you're going to see variations of uh, flavor development. Uh, across that region so then being able to go in and say you know I'd like to get you know a, a spicy bourbon from Indiana or I want to get a, a, a fruitier bourbon from Tennessee uh, I think you, you, you're able to do that because uh, of the different again yeast strain mash bill and then the difference in the, uh, the warehousing maturation well, you know what the next question people want to know is, where are you getting these barrels? <laughs> we go to the barrel store. The barrel getting yeah. place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get let, me, let me throw something. I mean, to, if, if you want to go down this road, something completely different that we're working on, speaking of different states, is we're, we're about to blend um, a totally different product, an American vatted malt product. Which So there are a lot of incredible American single malt producers in the United States can't call it scotch because i mean it's in scotland and there isn't even really a category for for malt it's either malt whiskey which malt whiskey technically has to be in new barrels and a lot of times the malt producers want to put it in used barrels so we're we're going to be working with six or eight distilleries we are we are working with six or eight distilleries from around the country arizona new mexico washington new york texas uh i think i may be missing one or two and so we're, t- we're getting barrels from all over the country, and we're blending those. So you're going to see some real, incredible regional differences when we, when we, when we put this together. That's going to be that's in, one of the next projects we're working on. That's going to what be, makes up a malt, American malt whiskey? Like, like somebody that doesn't know, uh, uh, a.k.a. me. Yeah, I was what like, is oh, it? <laughs> no, an American, makes an American malt whiskey. You want to take this? Or? It's, 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 it's um, malted barley. Okay. And so um, it's generally... M- majority is malted barley, and there's uh, and and sometimes there's some corn in there, but for the most part, it's distilled malt, single malt malt. So that's barley. the the primary grain, I guess. Yeah, okay. that's grain. So this is a little bit different than bourbon. Sure. And there's some gr- <laughs> there's a group that's actually lobbying uh, to the TTB trying to get a the malt category mm-hmm. to create something create something for us, us being the distillers. What is it that you like about the malt that's gonna I guess fit the barrel profile or blends or whatever. What? Well, it, it's um, yeah. I was like, can this compete with uh, you know Forbes Whiskey of the Year as well? Like, how many medals can this one? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's that, that's sort of a nice. It's a nice accolade. We don't. It's not our our, our, our goal. To, you know, we, we really we love hearing other people talk about our products and um, but the goal is to really is to make a product that people really love to drink. Um, I don't know. I mean, this hasn't been done before, um, you know. But but the inspiration of it was we we, we taste a lot of whiskeys and and we, and we know a lot of producers and and there is just an incredible amount of really high quality single malt producers in the United States and they're relatively unknown. 
Um, I shouldn't say that. I mean, of course, there's Balcones, everybody knows them, and then there's Westland, everybody knows those guys. But there are a lot, when you start getting into the smaller ones, there are a lot of people who don't know. So we really wanted to bring that, we wanted to bring that out and, you know, and, 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 and take our cut at it, which is to take some of these great products. I mean, the world is our ingredients, the world is our pantry, and take them and blend them together into something, you know, even greater than the parts, we hope. So, we'll see. I was about to say you keep going down this path, and we were, you know, we'll, we'll talk about dovetail here in a second because you were talking about all the TTV different categories. Like it seems like you're you're trying to make their job harder by making them just create new categories just for you, like blending everything from here and there. We're trying to make the job easier if they just go along. <laughs> 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 well, the the difference, um, the 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 vatted the the vatted malt and the malt whiskey is sort of a different. It's a different. It's a different problem because um, there just isn't a category for what they want to produce, which is a um, a, a straight malt whiskey that is does not have to go into a new barrel. Because most scotch, all scotch, is in used barrels, and and there are different properties, different characteristics. And we're doing with this vatted project, we're doing a combination of whiskey that went into new barrels and whiskey that went into into used barrels, previously used barrels. Um, but uh, that aside, um, the whiskey category is is a then the blended whiskey category is sort of a, a a really unusual one, because traditionally a blended whiskey has can have 20% grain neutral spirit in it. So it's a category that's just that it was you know was really looked down on a blended whiskey category. Our whiskeys, every one of our whiskeys, is 100% whiskey. So with it's dovetail, not, uh, you're not doing Seagram Seven and Seven. Or <laughs> no, we're not. We're, we're not putting grain neutral spirits and uh, and whiskey together. And coloring and all that and stuff. No food yeah. coloring. Yeah. There's no coloring. I mean, we we do if nothing. If not, to you it. do you do really awesome food coloring. It's <laughs> one of the, speaking of blended, I found I went to a state sale the other day and got a bottle of. It's called Golden Wedding. It was like from the 30s or something. Wow. And it was a, a, a blended whiskey, but I was like, oh, this is going to be great. I'm just, and it was terrible. <laughs> and you could tell it was nutri grain spirits with like like brown dye in it or something. Probably but, beat ground up beetles. Yeah, exactly. That was an Probably, ingredient yeah. of bourbon in the. No. It in, wasn't. It, yeah. In the early 1900s and the late 1800s. It tasted worse than that. I wish it was. It was color. They used it for color. It was kind of people. It was creosote, too, a little bit. But but so the the dovetail is, I think the dovetail is a really, is an interesting project. Originally, it was going to be our whiskey number six. And so, and what's in it is. That was the name? That was the original like, project Well, we name. have a series of whiskeys. We have barrel whiskey, and we do them in batches just like the bourbon. So it was, okay, this is the next one. And and, and what it what's in this product is. Um, 11 year old Indiana whiskey that we finished in uh, Dunn Vineyards Cabernet Barrels Dunn Vineyards is this really incredible Napa Valley 100 year old family vineyard and they make an incredible rich lush Cabernet and so we got their barrels and we and we finished that whiskey in it then we took um, some Tennessee bourbon and finished some of it in, in, in rum casks so our rum casks so we bring rum in from the different countries. It usually comes in in a steel container because the barrels will leak all over the place. We put it in X bourbon barrels. And then when we're finished, we dump it out and we take those X bourbon barrels that had rum in it and finish some bourbon in it for this product. We also have some, some uh, bourbon finish in late uh, vintage port pipes. So there's a combination of different whiskeys in here with different finishes, different proportions. We blended it. And sent the label off to the TTV, and six months later, and for everybody at home, this is what we're talking about: the dovetail. <laughs> so, what's what's the? Is we couldn't a, call it whiskey. You know, so what's the category that this is filed under? So, this is technically a distilled spirit specialty. Okay. Which okay. is in the same category that you can have bubblegum flavored vodka, and mm-hmm. you can have 100% whiskey. So, it's a little bit, it's a little bit. It's a little bit of an odd category, and but that's, but it's fine that you have that because this is like the one product that I see like people are like this is actually really good like you've got to go out and get some, and, and I'm trying it right now and yeah I'm kind of floored like how Thank really you. good it is. I mean you get you get those bubble that's gum what we're going kinda, for yeah. you get those bubble gum <laughs> yeah. notes yeah. you get some of that. It reminds of me of uh, a grape airhead. You know those like chewable. Man, you come you come strong. <laughs> you know the chewy candies as a kid. You know the like strips or like fruit by the foot. You know yeah. like yeah. something like that. It's, <laughs> Like you said, you love those juicy fruit yeah. kind of. That this is like you get those notes. Those We're happy little, to get those notes. Yeah, sugary kind of grape notes. So uh, yeah. 
We want to bring you back to your childhood. That's what we're. I do. I I try to take everything I've had in my childhood. I'm like, all right, I taste this and that or whatever. So it t- totally reminds me of that. It's and true. one thing that you know, you just kind of, it kind of just piqued my interest a little bit when you were talking about like all these different barrels and all these different things you're doing. You could almost open up like your own like week long vacation where bourbon nerds could come in and they could just like just pay you to be there for a week and they could just sit there and just play around and experiment with everything and try to like make their own sort of crazy blend. I mean, because this was, I got to ask like how you, you got to this idea that we should blend these two together. <laughs> yeah. Why didn't you stop at the, the, the uh, Indiana the Vineyards, yeah. blend in the Cabernet? Is it because like, Oh, uh, that's been done. Whatever, before. yeah. Wine that's a finished, great question. Wine finished barrels are like, yeah, so passe. Like everybody does them now. Well, we try. We we are always trying to try different and new things. But we have these meetings where we all get together every 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 month, two months probably, and we just brainstorm ideas. What what is what is the most crazy thing we can do? What's the? Uh, can you just tell the story about the about the Tale of Two Islands? So that was that was a meeting where we sat down and we needed some. What we, what we call it, one-off projects that we like to work on. And we knew that we wanted to use some of our leftover Jamaican rum from uh, batch one. And so we wanted to do a finish. And we didn't know what we were going to do. And we had like 20 samples set up in front of us. And, and so what, what do we want to do this finish or that finish? And at the very end, there was a blend of the rum with some Isla Scotch. And we thought there's no way this is going to taste good, and it, we, it's the one we like the best. And so we put that in a bottle and called it Tale of Two Islands, and it, it was uh, it was phenomenal. So you're blending scotch now too. <laughs> Cats out of the bag. We, have, well, we, we do we do we do have we do blend scotch into Infinite Barrel, we and Irish whiskey. Yeah, but these are, those casks are. Um, on, um, but but the, those ca- what I love about those casks is it's a Kentucky distillery, so I can't say that. <laughs> Which one? And then it, it went to we'll a great later, right? a great Isla distillery. Which I can't say that name either. (laughs) And we got the barrels with both their names on there. Why do you think that is like in the sourcing? Like I would think they would want it wanna know, like or want to be able to tell like, hey, this came from us. Like why why do you think they do that? Uh, well, I think um, there's a, there's a lot of reasons why people do it, but but part of it is they're protecting their trademark. So, in other words, they wouldn't want us to capitalize on their trademark. So sure. if, if we you know pick any pick any Kentucky distillery, <laughs> and if we use their name, they would sue us. You yeah. Know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Barrel Bourbon brought to you by X Y Z. And you know Kentucky is a litigious state, so it's you know it's sort of <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree, but I mean, this is this is a fantastic blend. Like this is the Thank first you. time that I've I've tried it, um, and and it's definitely something that I was just kind of like, wow, I didn't expect it. This is um, the first like whiskey blend or whatever category it is you want to call it that I could eat this with a ribeye almost. Like <laughs> it would go perfect like, yeah. with a big yeah. fatty steak, or okay. even like a, a dessert. Yeah, or as dessert. well. I and, mean, uh, just like a dessert kind of. But after like the Cabernet, break. like really is, you can taste it, and like kind of reminds me of some of those big bold cabs I like. I'm glad you like it. You can, you can. It pairs with so many. I'm different going to things. Ruby's uh, tomorrow night. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my <laughs> bottle with me. Take it. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, you just put, put a quick fee. Put it, put it in your flask, and <laughs> just know. yeah, just put it underneath the table there. So what's what's next? Actually, on the I just got. I just got. An, an, I should clarify one point, which oh, is okay. when we when we do our brainstorming, it's it's the company. It's we all get together. It's not just. Yeah. We spend too much time together anyway, just doing yeah. stuff. But, yeah. But well, it how many is in the company now? Uh, let's see, nine. Nine. nine okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're up to nine people. Did you when you started? Did you envision it getting this big? Do you envision getting bigger? Like, what are you happy where it's at? I mean. Kind of talk about from a business standpoint. The 2019 Kentucky's Edge Bourbon Conference and Festival pairs all things Kentucky with bourbon. It takes place October 4th and 5th at venues throughout Covington and Newport, Kentucky. Kentucky's Edge features a bourbon conference, music, tastings, pairings, tours, and an artisan market. Kentucky's Edge 2019 is where bourbon begins. Tickets and information can be found online at Kentucky's Edge.com. From forest to still, 
Bull Run Distillery whiskeys are using some of the best water in the U.S. They're also experimenting by aging them in different types of barrels, including Cognac, Madeira, and Pinot Noir barrels. Two of their whiskeys are being featured by Rackhouse Whiskey Club in their October box. Made from 96% corn, Bull Run's American whiskey is the lightest and sweetest product they offer and has very little barrel character to it. Accompanying that in the Rackhouse Whiskey Club box is a Pinot Noir finished whiskey. It's the same American whiskey, but finished in French oak barrels. You really have to try these two side by side to see what barrel aging can do. And you can do that by checking out Rackhouse Whiskey Club. They're a Whiskey of the Month Club on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Rackhouse boxes ship out every two months to 40 states. Go to rackhousewhiskeyclub.com to check it out and try these unique whiskeys. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. What defines Distillery 291 Colorado Whiskey is its spirit. Passion permeates every sip. Since day one, Distillery 291 distills from grain to barrel to bottle by hand, distinctive Colorado whiskey. Utilizing grains from the Colorado Plains and water collected from Pikes Peaks Reservoirs, 291 Colorado whiskey is handmade the Colorado way. Everything matters. 291 Colorado whiskey has earned bushels of national and international awards for its spirits with the unique character and the flavor of a bygone era. Named World's Best Rye in 2018 by World Whiskey Awards, seven liquid golds from Jim Murray's Whiskey Bible, 291 Colorado Whiskey embodies the traditions of the past, married with the boldness of the future. Find a bottle near you at 291coloradowhiskey.com. Ride it like you stole it, drink it like you own it. Live fast and drink responsibly. Did you, when you started, did you envision it getting this big? Do you envision getting bigger? Like what? Are you happy where it's at? I mean, kind of talk about from a business standpoint. Um, um, we're happy with the growth. Um, uh, I, we're ambitious. We want to be. We want to be as big as we can grow. Um, we're very happy with the control growth we've been having. We've been doubling every year, and um, and we're it's we're, we're we're on track. We're absolutely on track to where we want to be. How tough is it to like? I think you said you're like. 100% up from last year. What are some of the challenges that you faced? Like, I guess going from, you know, experiencing that much growth. Cause like for me, 20% growth is like chaos in my business. I couldn't imagine <laughs> doing like a hundred percent growth. And so talks about some of the challenges or hurdles that you face doing that. Well, we've been, um, we've been planning from a business perspective. We've been really planning on this. Uh, oh, wait a minute. We have 10 people in the company. I just yeah. got a somebody yeah. just got hired. Yeah, somebody just <laughs> we had to phone a friend. <laughs> and I got the list. There's that, ten. Better, nine, better, nine. better. Somebody's getting fired after yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you don't know. There's going to be nine tomorrow. If I keep getting texts like that. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> it's just in. Someone got hired a barrel. <laughs> but but to, to answer your question, um, we're we spend a lot of time planning. We we plan our releases. We plan our production schedule. We we uh, we account for growth within that and so it's so a, a lot of it is logistics planning getting the barrels to the right place at the right time getting the bottles the corks all that stuff making sure that everything is everything is is lined up and correct and we and we plan for our goals which are which we've been pretty close we've been we've been hitting our goals and exceeding our goals so we're, we're already anticipating that growth so we're we factor that into into everything that we do you know, you've been selling through your batches very, very quickly, and our distributors sitting there knocking on your door, like, "Joe, we're we're ready for the next one. Like, hurry up! When's it like, coming? Yeah, when's it coming?" <laughs> That's such a complicated business. It's incredible because, well, first of all, distributor is sort of a generic term. We we've put together a network of distributors across the country. We're, we're with a couple that were in more than one state, but for the most part, we've been very careful about who we align with because they have, to, they have to be the right size we don't want them to be too big so we get lost we don't want them to be too small because they won't have the capital to buy the products that we need so it's it's a very it's a very um, 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 it, it's not such a straight line and some are better than others some are better others are planning and some will will are right on top of the releases and others they need a monthly call to say, by the way, did you put your purchase order in? And then it's not, it's not usually because they don't want to. It's because they're they they have a lot of products and they're they're torn in a lot of different directions. 
but it's it's a very you know it, the, that whole aspect of the business is just is just different. It's different from any other business because you have it, it, you're, it's like you're dealing with fifty different countries. Every state has its own laws. There's a, there's the federal layer, but every state every state can trump it. And then you've got thirteen control states, which which are all entirely different, and they're all government uh, state run. But each one of those has different regulations and rules. So it's, and then you have what's called franchise states, which are states that you make an agreement with a distributor, and you can never leave, no matter what the contract says. I've heard about You're, those. Yeah, it's, uh, that's not fun. Yeah. Yeah, because you got to be careful. You, yeah, you partner with somebody, and they kind of just screw you over, and you, you're 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 stuck, right? You're contracted in for X amount of time. But we we've been we've had good relationships, yeah, because our products are selling, and so there's they do well, and then they're yeah, happy. Like, but if you don't do well, then they're not happy. Then that's a different story. Well, good. Yeah. So if you're not going to come out with like barrel vodka yet, and then that's going to be sitting on the shelves. Is that? Is I think I think Fred's been telling us that we should do that. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's an advocate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know how much he likes vodka. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think he's got t-shirts and hats and everything. Hats but that how much he loves it. Oh, yeah. absolutely. So no, we're not going to like him. So from your side of the business, would you guys be for uh, online sales or you absolutely. Know, across? Okay. Our original, my original business model that I wrote was all online sales. Yeah. But because it, it just – and the thing the, – the reality is is the, the, it doesn't affect the distributors. It actually helps distributors. It would, it would open up another channel and save them money. But they've got to see that point, the connection. Oh, no. The more we do with – Where do you think better. the disconnect is with them? Is it, I mean, I guess just anything with bourbon or li- liquor, everything's so, like, old school. They don't want to change. They're like – I don't know. They're just stuck in an old mindset. You've got big aircraft carriers traveling – and in order to turn those around, it requires a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people and a lot of a lot regulation. Of <laughs> it's all that sort of stuff combined. Now, because I, I think we've we've talked about it on the podcast before, we've had on the roundtables to kind of like figure out like what what's the discussion of you know why can't we open this up like when is Amazon finally going to start delivering to your door and Prime next day you know dovetail next to you. Um, and when people are going to start setting up online scrapers to go ahead and buy allocated products, like as soon as it hits Amazon or something like yeah. that, right? So the day could come. It probably will come. It's just who knows when it's going to be. But I kind of want to talk about, you know, a little bit more about Trip, you know, the operation side of this, because I think that really what people want to know more about is is the blends um, and everything that's going into this. So kind of talk about really what's next on the horizon for you all. And, and are you worried you're going to run out of discs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and because there's other thing that you, you talked about before we started recording this is you were saying that you guys are tripping over barrels yeah. at your warehouse. Like, yeah. you've got that much stuff going on. And if on. you're yeah. ready to sell some, we'd be happy to take <laughs> any off your hands. <laughs> that or we'll just go and make our own blend. Yeah, yeah, I know. Really, really. There we go. So the, the, series, uh, blend. The, the process logistics get a little tricky when you've basically grown out of your space. So all the way back to what we order and when we order it so joe and i'll have an idea what we're going to do so we're so we're going to have a you know a dovetail and a batch of bourbon we'll have to do infinite and we'll just have a list and then in our minds we'll go through and figure out what barrels we think are going to go in each of those plus what we already have in house so we'll ship everything in order and as it comes in it literally comes off the truck goes to the dump trough gets dumped into the tank empty barrel goes back out and onto another truck because we don't have room to keep the empties in there so that process goes on for an entire day uh, when the truck's delivered so that that's kind of how we get our base and then once we have the base for whichever project we're working on it then becomes the the treasure hunt of what flavors are we missing where do we find them and how do we put those together um but it is it, it's a bit of a logistical mess to do all that in a in a small space, and uh, it was kind of funny the the last the last time we got we got three trucks in one day, and for our space that's a ton, and we had to strategically place them in the facility so that right up front where the tanks are we had tanks forklift dump trough, and then we just started working our way back dumping barrels working because there was no room there was a path through the play that was it and just it so- used to be a two-dimensional problem yeah. what was on the floor yeah, yeah. now it's re- it literally is a three-dimensional That's problem right. it's like tetris i mean tetris we're we're up four four levels 
Oh wow! A yeah, barrel so we have to move around. And just so people understand, I at least this. I, at least the, from at least I think my knowledge. So a, a truck is about ninety six barrels. Is that about what comes in them? Depending on how they're shipped. Yeah. Yeah. Or so eighty four. Depends if they're up or down. Yeah. So what up? What do you get four on a pallet? Well, if you do six pallets, it's eighty four based on weight. But you can get. Uh, I'm lost. I don't do math. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but you can do it without the pallets, and you can get a few more. So you ever? But that's worry? more work. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's so. more human work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Are you ever worried when, when Joe or anybody else on the team, because we've now uh, clarified that there's 10 people right. on the team. <laughs> um, maybe 11 by now. <laughs> <laughs> or none. When, when like, an, an idea comes up and you're like, oh, God, here we go, another label. And, like, you have to continue these these product expansion lines because you're still doing your barrel batch bourbons. Yep. You've got your infinite. You've got... Um, uh, you've got your rum. I mean, you've got all kinds of, you've got your new year's Eve bottle. Yeah. So kind of talk about like, when is that going to end? Because you know, it's, it's or like a scale up thing that, that you're tr- or like a scale out thing versus like trying to scale up. That's kind of hard yeah. to be able to do. I would say that first off, we love to innovate. We'd love to do things that have not been done. We like to be creative, come up with, we've got a stack of ideas that if we had more time, we would be able to do. Um, so, We love that. We don't want that to stop. Um, When we talk about, you know, the the batches and and the expansion and everything, when you look at someone who does a product the same way every single time, which there's something to be said for, um, they've already got a cola. They already have all that stuff approved. They know what's going into that bottle. It's just a matter of doing the same thing every time. Every time Joe and I put something together, we start from square one. So the bottle doesn't change, the shape of the label doesn't change, but everything that's on the label, front and back, changes, which means it has to go get COLA approvals and then come back to us. Everything that's in that bottle is going to be different, which means we've selected different barrels, we've come up with new ideas, we've put different blends together, and then once everything is approved, we've uh, we've signed off on the blend, it gets bottled, cased, and shipped. So every single time anything goes out, from uh, from Barrelcraft Spirits, we've started from square one to create that, and then on top of that, trying to constantly um, innovate and and better ourselves with each new product that we release. So purposely inefficient is that the, the best way? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, well, the one thing that we have done is we spent a lot of time in the original label design, um, creating the structure of the label, um, and we have essentially a matrix of product. So and we fill in. So there, there are, there's, you know, by type, whiskey, rum, rye, now DSS, um, and rum. And then there are different levels of, of, of that. We're at, we're at essentially uh, three price points, and all of our products fit into those three price points to make it easy for the customer and the distributor. And so then it's a question of, of creating the content for the label that fits that particular metaphor of that matrix. So we, we, we've, we've, again, everything we've done is a lot of real advanced planning. There's, some things look haphazard, but they're really not. We've actually done a lot of the thinking about this already in advance. We spent a lot of time planning. So with, with all these like line extensions and other things you're doing, are you looking at ever phasing anything off? Because it's, it's a lot to keep up with everything and to continue blending you know, great six, question. seven different sort of releases. Yeah, I think it is a great question, and I think I think the the, the public, you know, you guys will decide uh, some of that. When we, we we love doing everything that we're doing right now, Basically, but until if, something if you stops de- selling, if, if, yeah, I mean, if you if you decide or or the public decide that all of a sudden they don't like something, then we're probably not going to do that again. But I mean, currently, we're, we're having fun putting all this stuff out there. The other the other thing too is is if we don't like we have not done rum two yet because. We That's haven't true. found the rum that true. we've done a, a, a tale of two islands, which is a limited release. But rum two isn't out because we haven't found, and we've looked at a hundred different rums. We haven't found the right ones that, that we're looking at. We're about to do a rum project because we we did just buy a lot of rum, and I think that what we have is going to be interesting. It's a combination of at least uh, Jamaica Barbados Guiana. And maybe even Martinique. We'll see. I'm not sure. Um, and when that's right, when that's right, we'll release it. But we don't feel the need to have it. The only the only product that we want to have out there all the time is our bourbon and whiskey. Um, but if the rye isn't the one we want, then we'll wait. Um, rye three is we're kicking around rye three right now. Um, 
That's about to say. It's like you don't you don't see a whole lot of the the rye mm -hmm. on the shelves. Like that's kind of a really kind of hard to find product. And I think, it, correct me if I'm wrong, you were doing a few like single barrel rye this year as yes. well. We did we did a a, a a fair amount of single barrel Canadian rye. They were. 13, 13 years old mm -hmm. um, and they were um, they were uh, they were 99 or 95 percent rye um, they were spectacular yeah we we, we have another Canadian we, rye they're good we, we, <laughs> we, we Canadian rye you know if you leave it alone and use they have it, a lot of those uh, grape and juicy fruit flavors that they you do. guys like mm -hmm. so I'm not surprised that <laughs> you all like those <laughs> yeah and the one we we are, we, we, we are about to acquire a lot of Kenny rye and the first thing the trip tasted was bubblegum on it it's so true it's a very bubblegummy how's rye. a I got a question about source the buying rum and sourcing is that similar to the bourbon game like is it similar or totally different like, totally different okay because yeah. I know with bourbon you got brokers and all that stuff and you don't really talk I didn't how's that process work with Pretty sure you just get a one-way ticket to the islands and hang out <laughs> yeah. there for a few months and try that already <laughs> yeah, yeah shake a few hands and figure what you can do it's very different and it depends on it depends on the, the, the distillery but but um there is there's a lot of spirits available you just have to know where to get them and rum is rum you know aside for a couple of very specific distilleries it's readily available i mean there, there's if you you'll notice there's um a lot of rums from central america there's rum from south america out there now you know and and they're all very different i mean you, you know some of them are just too much sugar for us it's it's not what we want we, we tend to really like those the purest funky, kind of things yeah the or funky dunder the, the fermentation distillation process mm -hmm. you know just really heavy duty fat rums real oily, I was about oily. To say, so, so if you guys do a lot of just bourbon whiskey and it sells then why rum like why it's it's i guess it's one of those things it's you know Fred you told them to well no, no i mean yeah. you look at it you it look at it good. you look at it from a business perspective and you're like okay like we're gonna we're gonna chop off like the dead weight like is is rum a dead weight to you or is it still like that's still experimentation well think about it this way the person who drinks our rum is really a high-end whiskey or bourbon drinker so you're not going to take our rum and mix it with coke i mean th this is not a light rum or white rum this is these are serious serious products to drink so it, it's a there's a natural crossover between some of the high-end whiskey drinkers to some of these sort of vintage or really uh, esoteric rums they're not for everybody and and I don't even believe that rum is the next whiskey category. I think that this is that the people who drink the rums that we that we will bottle are a subset of the people who drink the whiskeys. They're not necessarily hardcore rum drinkers, although the people who like rum do drink our rum, but it's not the general population. So we do it because because our customer likes it, and we like it. And you know our promise is we only put in the bottle stuff that we like. You know. <laughs> well, you said rum's not the next category so. what do you think is the next category i think american whiskey's got a lot of room to go i think we're i think we're in the six my opinion completely <laughs> we're in the sixth inning of bourbon we got a way to go with that but american whiskey is there's a long runway on that i think people are going to discover it the way they discovered bourbon and that sort of fits our model you know we, we we're looking we look at people want to know what's new and what's different and what's exciting we're always doing something new and different and exciting and I think that if you look at that, that's what people like, and we're going to just keep doing that. I'll toss one at you because uh -oh. I know uh, that uh, oh a lot. Well, no, I mean, Where do you buy your whiskey from? No, <laughs> we won't go there. I know we're not going to get that one out of you unless I <laughs> choke hold we'll you on the floor here. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we already know. We won't say. <laughs> the, um, so a lot of people look at Armagnac as a as a as a kind of a good substitute for whiskey because it's it's it doesn't have the same kind of flavor profile but you do get some like very dark and condensed sort of flavors and uh floral and fruity notes have you guys even thought about looking at armagnac as a possible Absolutely. source okay the nuance flavor yes the answer the short answer is yes yeah we don't know what we're going to do yet. Dovetail but three. It's on Dovetail there. three. <laughs> Dovetail three point five. Actually, yeah. we're already. We just finished. Uh, yeah, we just finished, finished three. three. We're all four. Ah. <laughs> so, so talk Dovetail about six, talk maybe. about talk about three real quick since it's mm. probably going to come out. So, kind of talk a little bit about like what was in the blend. Is it a little bit different than what we're drinking now? Like, kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we're there, just talking about that. Yeah, there. Um, the interesting thing about Dovetail is that it is going to be a little bit different every time, but we do use you know the same similar ingredients. Um, in that 
the the barrels are the same, but you know grapes change every year. So the wine that was in the barrels that we may get next time might be a little different than what we used previously. So there's going to be some flavor differences there. Uh, we might use a different rum barrel. We might use a Jamaican rum barrel instead of a, 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 Guyana, a Guyanese rum barrel. Or, um, you know, all of those things are going to put subtle differences in there. But at the end of the day, when everything's put together, you still taste all of the same flavor characteristics, but a lot of them are in different concentrations. So it's, 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 a, it's a similar experience, but it's not the same experience. Uh, and, and I think being able to to put all of those compounds in there in those different concentrations and let them vary a little bit as you go along uh it, it's it's kind of fun to do you know and so another thing that you kind of just piqued my interest a little bit too um i saw something from uh, another friend of the show wade woodard today and we were talking about oh finishing <laughs> well it's, it's, it was more or less around like finishing versus aging so yeah. you're talking about putting something into the barrel and now do you all look at what you're doing as finishing like it's just in the period in there for a short period of time kind of marry some flavors are you like really aging something in there no i, I mean everything we use is yes. is, is aged. yes yes the yeah. boat i mean it's, yeah <laughs> it's we put it in there for um some maturation but mainly it's, it's a finishing yeah mm-hmm. And some, yep. so we have some whiskeys that, I mean, we have some things we've been finishing for two That's years. True. I mean, you'd have to classify that. That would, yeah. that would be aged. Yeah. I would, I would yeah. consider two years aged. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the funny thing is, you know, the. Um, I would think. So. I think but 30 yeah. minutes is finished. <laughs> yeah. Two well, years is probably aged. Well, yeah. the rum finishing, or the rum finishing we do, it can be as short as two weeks. I mean, it depends on it depends on the particular finishing agent. And for us, one of the things that we've really been careful about is we don't want the finish to overpower anything in fact we we don't even really want you to taste the finish we want the finish to enhance the whiskey and make that greater than than the either either parts so you'll pick out some of the notes and you may pick up run characteristics but for the most part what you're really tasting is something that's that has been created from the different finishes in the different whiskeys so it's a totally different new flavor experience altogether yeah so we joe want, i gotta I want you to taste it and go wow what's that and what then go it? back and taste it again mm-hmm. and then try to figure out what it is and then I don't buy want, another bottle yeah. 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 exactly and we don't want you to t- uh, take a sip of it and go oh wow that tastes like a uh, big bold cap yeah you know we, we want you yeah. to, to, well, to shit, really I experience that about it Dev-tail. i know that's why because... i said it no. <laughs> <laughs> no but we actually that's that I, that's probably an exception because that that cab is such an exceptional product right. that, that that it just brings out some beautiful nuance. Some people uh, about finishes, uh, I guess they they have a concern that how much product is left in the barrels when your product goes into it. Can you talk about that when you get these barrels? Like, are they completely bone dry? Are they have some in them? Do not you know? They just wet. We don't. I mean, we're not. That's a. That is Most of the time a you really want them, you want good them question. Wet, though. You yeah. want them wet yeah. usually. You yeah, know, you, you, they want you want to be wet, but you don't want them to be sloshing around with three gallons of product. Right. And the, and that is an issue with certain finishes on products where people are buying barrels that have, you know, a couple ten gallons left this in there. Is that right. That's a whole different. That's a whole yeah. different experience. Now we're we we're, we. We play it straight down the middle. It's you know, if it needs, if we have to wet a barrel, we'll put a little bit in to wet it. But for the most part, it's the way we buy the barrels. So, you know, we've we've reused the Dunn Vineyards now three, t- it's three back three times. Oh wow! And we're gonna get more barrels from them, but you know, it really held up. Getting your mileage out of them, then we are. Yeah. So I guess one of the questions where we start kind of wrapping this up a little bit, kind of talk about really like what gets you going because we've talked about the barrel finishes, we've got. Actually, we didn't really touch on the infinite stuff that too much, but we, you know, you talk about dovetail. We got infinite, uh, and then you've got your your straight bourbon whiskey line. Really, like, when at the end of the day, like, what what keeps the engine going for you all? Like, in regards of like, just the passion behind it. You know, is it is it the finishing side or is it is it the straight bourbon whiskey side, the blending? You know, I think it's it's all about. And a cop out answer is saying both. <laughs> no, I won't do that. It's it's all about being creative, innovating. You know, we, we do things differently all the time. We don't do the same thing day in and day out. Uh, coming up with new ideas, trying to constantly better ourselves. Uh, I mean, all of those things go in go into it. There's not there's not a single day we go to work and do the exact same thing we did the day before. We don't want to make anybody feel bad, but 
we have the best job in the world. <laughs> I mean, every day is a great day. Every day is a new experience. It's it's Can no two stop? days are the same. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't you know. know. We, I mean, get, we get to sit here with these guys and drink their whiskey. Well, like no. it's a pretty good day I for know. us. It is a great. Well, the days great. we get to be with you are our best days. <laughs> yeah. uh, I like living that. our best life. We didn't even get to uh, Bourbon uh, Eighteen. Let's do it. Taste it. Let's do it real quick. I yeah, mean, just taste it real quick. Yeah. Seriously, so, so thing. I think I drink mine already. Oh, I already drank mine. Did you like it? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like, yeah. The what you you talk go about? around again? Yeah, might as well. I mean, we're here. <laughs> did you get those? Did you get those really subtle top notes? The fruity. No, I do. It reminds, it, it's crazy. It reminds me of. Oh uh, right, we said that. No, no, I did. But while well, I was talking about the dovetail, but even on this, it reminds me. There's some like some of the weeded mash bills have those fruity, juicy fruit notes, and I'm like, but I know there's not much weeded bourbon on the source market so i'm like what's in there you know i'm trying to figure out what's in there because there's uh, no we, we we have yet to we have not worked with the weeded bourbon yet we've we've looked at a few but just no this is there's no weed in this at all okay because it yeah the, the you know the like uh it's really good like, like dark cherry still yeah a lot of those good toffee notes and stuff like that too it's another home run guys like i said i love 17 18's right there with it I think I like 18. So this one, yeah, 18, I, 18 is holds a special place for us, and it did. I mean, it, it, wait, wait, the recognition. Wait, hold on, more than uh, 11, more than 11, because mm. 11 has 11's kind of like what, like really puts you on the pedestal there. You're kind of like rocky at that point. You, you know, know, you're sitting at the top of the stairs, jumping up and down. Because the answer is whatever the new one is is my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, and it, it's not because of any other reason as it really is. I mean, we like the thing that we're doing now, but this is just. This did. This did. This one got great recognition. It won best small batch. This bourbon. one's uh, like, a, I call them a guzzlers. Like the, you just sit here and like they're, <laughs> they're dangerously delicious. Like you wake you up can, and the bottle's empty. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like you it doesn't. Go buy another. <laughs> like it's just such good easy drinking. Like it's really good. Like I don't know. So, somebody just asked me, did you say weed or weeded? Weed, you know, weed. You know, where <laughs> CB, I taste the CBD oil in there. You know. Actually, it was my youngest daughter who asked that question. Oh, whoops. No, uh, I don't know what weed is then. <laughs> <laughs> I think last time we had talked, you know, you guys are in a location, but are you are you still, I mean, I know the main main game is sourcing. Like, is there still distillation in the future? Or is that starting? Like, what's, what's your, kind of what's the plan there? You gotta get rid of all those barrels. Yeah. Well, and that's that's part of the problem. It, it, as fast as we're growing, it becomes a, a little bit of a struggle to to keep putting these products together. Uh, and on top of that, space becomes a factor. So while everything that we talked about in the past, building the distillery and and you know focusing on uh, different nuances in the uh, yeast fermentation and distillation uh, methodology. We're still planning to move in that direction. We just have to figure out how we're going to do all of that. Um, again, we're looking at different spaces now. Uh, Moving on, bigger and better, huh? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think now you guys. I think last time we talked, because you know, Joe, you and I, you came from a, we come from a tech background. Uh, you guys are in like an underground bunker that used to be a like data storage facility or something like that. A, a cricket wireless facility. Yeah. <laughs> We, our sewer room is our bottling room, which is we have the most temperature and humidity controlled bottling room in the state, <laughs> in the country. Yeah. So we have happy workers. Happy not, workers. Yeah. yeah. I um, yeah. Um, does it does it bum you out? Like, cause you you're the distiller. That do you want to make your own juice or are you oh like, absolutely or are you like yeah that's, I'm, uh, I'm totally content with the blending side. That that was more my my forte uh, in the business is really fermentation distillation yeah. yeast fermentation distillation um the blending has been fun you know it was it was something that in, in my previous life i hadn't put a whole lot of focus on and then meeting joe and, and, and our collaboration has really opened up uh more doors uh on creativity uh putting things together and really i think that we've only told part of the story say half of the story as far as blending and flavors are concerned because there's a whole nother side of this story that comes from yeast fermentation distillation and maturation and when you understand where to go to get the flavors that we talk about in these in these uh, mature barrels then you can start creating the things that you're after and instead of going to find them you can make them on the front end yeah so there so there, there's a whole nother piece to this puzzle um that Hopefully one day we get to get to share. <laughs> so you're still. I think, I think I think just to sort of the 
remember, we, we, we tend to look at things a little bit differently. So we went down the road um, when, we, when we did the planning on the distillery on becoming a production facility. And then we realized that that's not really what we want to do. We don't necessarily want to build the factory to make that product. And all along, that product we were going to distill would be an ingredient in, in our product mix. It was never the idea to, to let it replace everything we're doing. We're going to continue to source. Yeah. So that that was a, again, we planned everything. That was a year, more than a year of planning. And then we had this realization where it's like, that's not the way we want to do it. So now we've been in this other planning phase of how we're going to do it differently than being a production facility. And I, I don't really want to say more than that right now, but that's, and I don't mean to be elusive about it, but but we are thinking about and planning a different way of, of approaching distillation in the way that it fits into our product mix. It's more in keeping with what we do. Well, um, that sounds that, like we're gonna, next year. We're going to save that for episode chapter. Episode 350. Yeah, yeah. I was like, we'll save that <laughs> chapter three right there. That's yeah. what we're going to yeah. save it as. That's awesome. We'll have our own recording studio by then. <laughs> That's the goal. It's pretty nice right now. Yeah, see, you don't, we don't get couches like this at my house when we're sitting here recording. <laughs> Not so. at all. It's fantastic. No barking dogs. Oh yeah, we we were able to go live at least, and you know we had we had some you know some servers and so we're going in the background, but that's okay. It's what you expect. We're down here at a restaurant, you know, down one bourbon bar. So thank you for them for for hosting us once again, Joe and Trip. I'm gonna say thank you so much again for joining us today. Uh, give you another opportunity just to say where people can learn more about your products, where they can sign up for your newsletter, because I know that I get your newsletter uh, every month. It's always fantastic to read. You know how much you guys are killing it too. So go ahead and tell people, you know, where they can learn more. Um, BarrelBourbon.com, two R's, two L's, Barrel Craft Spirits, or any misspelling of those two words will get you to our website. (laughs) And again, thanks to uh, everybody who supports the brand. You know, you're the reason we get to keep doing it. I'll I'll say it every time. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Well, when you put out good stuff, it's easy to support it. So it really is. And, you know, again, thank you guys for coming on. Uh, You know, Batch 18, if it's out there, find it, buy it. It's terrific, and you can find Dovetail. I mean, that's, Dovetail is crazy that's, good. That's crazy. <laughs> Thank you. Like I yeah. said, it's just a truly, it's a truly unique kind of. Uh, I don't, you can't even call it whiskey. What do I have to call it? It's <laughs> whiskey finished in Dunn Vineyards Cabernet Barrels Rum and port, Late Vintage Port Cask. That's the name. Yeah, that's a long one. Uh, I'm not gonna, <laughs> not gonna put that one on just a business dovetail. card, but you know, <laughs> just say Dovetail. That'll work. Yeah, Dovetail. It's just booze. Not yeah. kidding. <laughs> but it's really good booze. So again, thank you all for for coming on here and doing this. This is a pleasure. Uh, and thank you everybody that tuned in live uh, and got a chance to kind of hear these guys up close and personal. I, I saw my phone was going off, so I know there were some comments going on. Uh, sorry, I couldn't get to any of the questions, but uh, make sure you follow Bourbon Pursuit on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Also follow these guys because they're on all those social media channels as well at barrel bourbon and ryan go ahead and close us out my phone was going off too but people were yelling at me about stuff <laughs> that sounds so like my phone it wasn't exciting <laughs> so uh but no thanks to down one for hosting us this is a great venue great spot love these couches i'm gonna hopefully we'll keep to get keep to continue to get to use them and trip and joe thanks as always You're my favorite guest because you're always bringing booze, now dog toys. I'm I'm (laughs) excited to see what's next. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Sounds great. Thank Thank you. Cheers, everyone.